Welcome to the DMI interview series, Leaders in Defense Management. In May 2023, I sat down with former Comptroller General David Walker. It was a great conversation touching on issues including differences between public and private sector management practices. I hope you find it as informative as I did. I'm Peter Levine, the Director of the Defense Management Institute, and we're here today to begin a series of, of interviews with individuals who've made significant contributions to improving the management of the Department of Defense. We begin today with the Honorable David Walker, who served as the seventh Comptroller General of the United States from 1998 to 2008. As Comptroller General, Mr. Walker played a key role in modernizing the Government Accountability Office and focusing the GAO on critical issues important to government management. Mr. Walker has also served in the public sector as leader of the Employee Benefit Security Administration, as one of two public trustees for Social Security and Medicare, and as a distinguished visiting professor at the U.S. Naval Academy. He served in the nonprofit sector as, as the president and CEO of the Peter G. Peterson Foundation and as president and, CEO and president and CEO of the Comeback America Initiative. And he has over 20 years of experience in the private sector with Arthur Anderson, Price Waterhouse and Company, and Coopers and Librand. It is no exaggeration to say that David Walker has, de has devoted virtually his entire career to the mission of making the federal government more efficient and more affordable. Mr. Walker, welcome. Peter, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Good to see you again. Well, we're delighted to have you here today. Can we start with just the question of what brought you to the public sector? What brought you to the government after what must have been a very successful career in the private sector? Well, I'm a big believer that everybody ought to do some type of public service. Uh, could be in the military, could be as a civil servant, could be as a presidential appointee, could be in the not-for-profit sector, or could even be some type of critical occupation where the economy needs more people to deal with that area, whether it be education or healthcare or whatever. In my case, I had appointments to the Naval Academy and the, and the uh, Air Force Academy, but I couldn't go because I have a bad left ear. Uh, and as a result, I had planned to be career military. Uh, in particular, I wanted to be, a, a hope, ideally, to make it to Marine Corps General and, you know, through an uh, aviator route. But that was not possible because of my ear. Uh, and later on, I was offered an opportunity to come into the Reagan-Bush administration at the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, which I took. Uh, I thought I'd be there for two years, and I was there longer, and then I went on to the de Labor Department. Uh, and so it really comes down to service above self. Uh, and I'm also a Rotarian, and that's one of the big themes of Rotary. It's service above self. What surprised you most about government coming in, coming in at, at mid-career? Um, what differed from the private sector or what differed from your expectations? Well, there are a lot of differences. I'll just mention a few. First, the lack of strategic planning. Uh, and to this day, the U.S. government still does not if have a forward-looking, risk and opportunity-based, results-oriented, resource-constrained strategic plan. It has an annual budget, uh, but that's not a strategic plan. Importantly, without a strategic plan, you're really not going to maximize your effectiveness, uh, economy, efficiency, effectiveness. In addition, without a strategic plan, our competitors uh, have an advantage over us, in particular China, who does have a strategic plan that focuses on economic, diplomatic, military, cultural, and other perspectives, uh, as evidenced in, in large part by their Belt and Road Initiative. We don't have a plan. So without a plan, all you have is prayer. Don't get me wrong, I'm for prayer, but I'm for prayer and a plan. So the first thing is a lack of strategic plan. The second thing is, is government tends to be risk averse. Uh, and government tends to be very process oriented rather than results oriented. And so those are big differences. And, and in the obvious difference is, you know, the private sector has a lot more quantitative measures that it can go by, you know, market share, gross margin, net profit, earnings per share, total shareholder return, et cetera. You don't have that in government, okay? In, in, in government, typically, the, the mentality is get the money, spend the money, all right? And uh, so those are some of the differences. Um, as Comptroller General, you had a unique viewpoint from which to look across agencies and across the federal government. You've already t you just talked about some of the, some of the weak points in, in, in federal management. I wonder if I could throw you a curveball and ask you if you see any strengths. Yeah, I mean, there are. I mean, there are certain things that the private sector can't do, won't do, shouldn't do, okay? And uh, there are certain responsibilities that have to be done at the federal level, such as national defense, uh, you know, if you will, and uh, air traffic control and things of that nature. 
and, and so I think the government has improved. Uh, you know, as you, as you know, Peter, my predecessor, Chuck Bowser, may God rest his soul, he passed last year, he uh, started the high-risk list, and, and uh, DOD is prominently represented on the high-risk list, I might add, today. Uh, but, you know, and, and there have been some improvements since then. There are a number of things that have come off the high-risk list since then. You know, we, we have the CFO Act, we have the Government Performance and Resolved Act, we have the Chief Human Capital Officers Act. Uh, we, we have a number of things that have tried to institutionalize improvement in management throughout government. Uh, various agencies have done better than others uh, in trying to do that and, and trying to deal with those challenges. But I, I think we're better today than we were, but we still have a ways to go. Um, you mentioned the risk-averse nature of, of government agencies. and, and um Folks who are in the executive branch, they tend to look at oversight mechanisms as, as, a, as, as one of the drivers in that. That would include Congress, it would include inspectors general, it would also include GAO in, in, in that. As, as somebody who's seen, seen it from that side, how, how did you at GAO, or how do you think that an organization like GAO can do its important job without getting that kind of reaction and further driving a, a risk of... Well, well, that's an important question. And when I came into GAO, the Congress was not happy with GAO. The agency had been downsized 40% in the five years before I came. They had a five-year hiring freeze. I was told by leadership in Congress that it was going to be downsized another 25 to 40% if I didn't turn it around. And so one of my objectives in becoming uh, Comptroller General was to make GAO a world-class professional services organization that just happened to be a wholly owned subsidiary of the federal government that practiced what it preached, led by example, and was a key to transformational change in government. And, and we did, okay? Uh, first, we had a strategic plan. It had been in existence since 1921, so we published our first ever strategic plan. We dramatically changed uh, the organization. Uh, um, you know, we, we eliminated a third of our offices. We eliminated a layer of management. Uh, we consolidated 35 units to 13. We focused more horizontally and externally rather than vertically. Uh, uh, we changed our performance measurement and reward system to focus on results uh, rather than uh, outputs, uh, if you will, uh, with, with a tr tremendously positive uh, result. Um, those changes, by the way, are transferable and scalable. But with regard to how we did our work, uh, I reminded people that we were here to try to help improve performance and assure accountability. But how we did that mattered, and that we need to employ a constructive engagement approach. And by that I mean we need to get the facts, we need to report what we found, but we shouldn't all be negative. So in other words, if somebody's making progress, we need to acknowledge that, okay? Uh, if somebody has a challenge that needs to be addressed, we need to point that out and make constructive recommendations as to how to deal with it. But we need to have a constructive working relationship and to the extent possible, be more balanced in what we're doing. And that was a change in mindset. It was a big change in mindset. The other thing that I recall is we had this high risk list, right? And quite candidly, a number of the items in the, on the high risk list weren't just an issue of the executive branch. The Congress was part of the problem, uh, and the Congress needed to be part of the solution. So one of the things I did is I said, all right, for those items where Congress is part of the problem, and Congress needs to be part of the solution, then we're going to put an asterisk on, on that item, and we're going to have some narrative in, in, in the report to point that out. And believe it or not, uh, I got a call from the Postmaster General thanking me for putting him on the high-risk list. But the reason he thanked me for putting him on the high-risk list was not because he was on the high-risk list, but because there was an asterisk that said that Congress was part of the problem and they need to be part of the solution. That's the case in a number of areas of the Defense Department as well. You mentioned that um, that a lot of the reforms that you made at GAO are, are scalable and, and and could be applied in in across government or in other parts of government. Are there specific lessons learned that you that you that you'd like to talk about that that could be applicable to other other parts of the government, to the Department of Defense, for example? Well, the Department of Defense is unparalleled in its size, scope, complexity, and importance. Uh, but yet there are a number of things that can be applied. I mean, DOD needs major transformational change. Uh, it, it has become a bloated bureaucracy, uh, and there's going to need to be a special initiative 
uh, where you have the attention of the secretary and the deputy secretary, but you have a high-level executive that is focused full-time on making major transformational change happen within the Department of Defense. It's going to be a several-year effort. I mean, it was a several-year effort at, at GAO, and GAO was much smaller and much more manageable than the Defense Department. Uh, so, so, you know, having somebody focused on it, having a plan with key metrics and milestone to be able to measure that progress, communication, 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 uh, absolutely essential, including from the top. I had monthly, uh, you know, what I call CG chats and said, this is where we've been, this is where we are, this is where we're headed, this is where the progress we're making, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it. And I would take, you know, get input, get suggestions, get recommendations from people, whatever. So very, very interactive. Uh, and before, by the way, we made all those, you know, those office closures, I went to every office. We had a standardized approach that they could make their case as to why they were an important office and why they should be re retained. They sent that in in advance. I reviewed all of those, but I went to every office and talked to everybody, you know, at group meetings in each of the offices and let them make their case, answer any questions before I made any decisions. So it's not just what you do, but how you do it that matters. And by the way, this doesn't just relate to management issues. I mean, one of the real concerns that I have right now is we're filming you know, we've got this debt ceiling deal uh, that's supposed to be voted on within the next week. And, you know, they made some modest progress, and we clearly want to avoid defaulting on our debt. But our imbalance is so great between projected revenues and projected uh, ex you know, expending that there's no way we're going to resolve that through the regular order. That's just not going to happen. And so we need a special initiative, I call for, a Fiscal Sustainability C Commission, which is statutory, that will end up engaging the American people with the facts, the truth, the tough choices, solicit input, as we did when I made changes at GAO, solicit all this input, make a package of recommendations where everything's on the table for an up or down vote. That's what we need. You need a similar management-oriented effort without an up or down vote because not everybody's going to be happy, okay, uh, in the Defense Department. I guess two other things I would say. So I'm leading towards you need a... Uh, a chief performance officer at the right level, uh, idea with a term appointment performance contract. You also need to do something with regard to Title X because I've seen Title X used as an excuse to, uh, you know, to, to stop uh, government, you know, DOD-wide needed management reforms. That should not happen, okay? Uh, when, when you have to end up making transformational management reforms, you shouldn't be able to use Title X as a basis to be able to, uh, to prevent something that needs to be done that's for the good of the department and the good of the country. You mentioned the need for, for, a, for a senior management official of some kind, and, and that's something that you and I worked together on when you were, when you were Comptroller General. And uh, we went through an experiment in the Department of Defense, uh, creating first a deputy chief management officer, a position in which I briefly served, um, and then a chief management officer, and then Congress abolished the position. Um, do you have any any insight from that ex experience or thoughts from that experience and how it how it impacts what the department needs going forward? What what did we do wrong and what could we do differently to make it right? Well, first, as you know, I'm on the Defense Business Board and I've been on the Defense Business Board for many years, either as an ex officio member, or non voting member, when I was Comptroller General, or as an official voting member, including in the last two administrations. Uh, the frustration I have is uh, that what was done to abolish the chief management officer was not consistent with what we recommended. Uh, what we recommended was the way that it had been implemented was never going to be successful. It didn't have a charter. Uh, it, it didn't uh, have the right reporting lines. It had certain responsibility, but not authorities. It was in the back, in the corner, in the dark, okay? It was not focused on transformational change. I mean, in fact, the, the CMO spent a lot of their time focusing on COVID issues or whatever, which is, you know, that's an important issue. Don't get me wrong, but that's not transformational change, right? Uh, and, and, and so I think what's necessary to be successful is you have to be at the right level. You have to be, you know, in OSD, I think, reporting directly to the deputy secretary, uh, somebody who has demonstrated experience making transformational change happen, uh, but has some understanding of the Defense Department because it is very different, if you will. 
uh, focus full time on transformational change, including but not limited to the high risk list that I referred to before. Uh, that has a term appointment, I, you know, I would say ideally five years, a five-year term appointment, because I think it's probably going to take that long, with a performance contract, all right? And then some people say, well, you know, what if we get a new secretary, a new deputy secretary? Look, if people don't get along with each other, this person ain't going to stay, okay? But what you need is you need somebody who, absent some significant event, can be there long enough that people can't just wait them out, because you know what the problem is in government. The top people in government are typically there two years, maybe three years. There are some exceptions, but that's typically what it is. And, and so if people don't want to change and, and, and they don't like something that's happening, they'll just wait them out. You know, in fact, a lot of the presidential appointees with Senate confirmation are known as the temporary help. This too will pass. I, I, I have sometimes thought that one of the problems that, that the CMO faced, CMO more than the DCMO, was that the expectations were so high. You have a, you, the high risk list you've mentioned covers um, most of the management functions of the Department of Defense, and, and taking on any one of those problems would be a huge multi year effort. Um, so it, it had been my theory that, that, that trying to focus on all of them at once was a losing proposition and you couldn't get there. I wonder what, what your reaction is. Uh, you're exactly right. You can't, you can't do everything at once, okay? You have to, you have to end up. Uh, you have to have a plan that, that is broad, that encompasses, uh, you know, that encompasses uh, a broad range of issues, but you need to set priorities, all right? And you need to be able to show that you're making progress uh, on, on that plan and based on those priorities. Uh, you know, it, you know it, it took a lot of years to get it that way. It's going to take a lot of years to get it off, right? But let's face it. I mean, the high-risk list has been around for 20 years, and a vast majority of the items that relate to DOD are still on it. All right. But all the more reason why you have to have a qualified person at the right level, they're focused full time, they're long enough in order to make real progress. Let me, let me change gears slightly and ask you about the financial audit. And the financial audit uh, is, is a huge issue for the Department of Defense because it's the only federal agency that still has not achieved uh, a, an auditable financial statement. Um, I have had concerns about the amount of resources the department plunges into the, the financial audit. Uh, I thought that the approach the department took a few years ago of, of saying we're going to wait till we're audit ready before we go and un undergo an audit was, was, was a wise one. I'm not sure that they're audit ready today, although they're trying to audit. Um, you saw it from a completely different angle, being a GAO that, that's in a sense the chief accountant of the federal government. What's your view of the place of the financial audit in the, in the, in the management of the department and the importance of, of the audit? Well, first, as Comptroller General of the United States, in effect, I was the Auditor General uh, and the Chief Accountability Officer of the United States. Um, you know, my view is the audit is a means to an end. It's not an end in and of itself. Our objective should be to operate in an economical, efficient, an effective manner, manner consistent with applicable laws and regulations and the overall priorities and philosophy of the leaders and, and the administration. Um, DOD has thousands of non-integrated information systems, okay? Those informations are used for multiple purposes, including financial management, okay? Uh, and those have to be rationalized. Uh, DOD has made some good progress in, in trying to create a, a summary database uh, to try to access some of that information for decision making at the highest levels, and they continue to make some progress on that. Um, my view is, is that the only thing that the American people really care about is an opinion on the consolidated financial statements of the U.S. government. I don't think they really care about whether or not you get an opinion on HUD or whether you get an opinion on DOD or whether you get an opinion on uh, the Transportation Department. But in order to get an opinion on the consolidated financial statements of the U.S. government, you can't ignore the Defense Department because, you know, there, in, in accounting, there's something called materiality, right? And there's no question that the Department of Defense is highly material to the consolidated financial statements of the U.S. government. And so it, that's got to happen. My personal view is that GAO ought to assume responsibility for the audit of, of the Defense Department because, uh, you know, using obviously the IG and using outside auditors, right? 
uh, because they're the ones that ultimately have to decide when DOD is ready. Um, because they're the ones, I, mean, I would have been the one that had to put my name on the audit report, uh, you know, once DOD gets, gets to the point where you can give an opinion. I also thought that DOD tried to get opinions on too many different entities. Uh, and to me, the objective is to get an opinion on the consolidated. You need to work horizontally, you know, by line item, and vertically to get to that. And you may want to demonstrate, you know, that a certain service or whatever, you know, ha has been successful to be able to show that you're making progress. But in the end, it doesn't make sense to have opinions on all these subunits. It just costs more money. And, and the degree of materiality of what it takes to cause a problem is a lot lower, whereas the degree of materiality, if you're looking on the consolidated DOD, is a lot less. I've also had recommendations, and I'll leave it at this, and, that have been published about some changes that I think would be appropriate with regard to a financial reporting for the Defense Department that would make it easier for them to get to the point where they could have an opinion on the financial. You mentioned the hundreds or thousands of, of different business systems the department has and the difficulty of getting them to, to, to work together and to produce sound data. And again, that's something that you and I talked about many times yeah. when, when we were both in, both in government. And I guess we went, I remember go, uh, while you were Comptroller General, the department went through this period of trying to develop a business enterprise architecture and seemed to finally decide that it was too complicated and they never figured it out. Uh, the, spent a lot of money on it. <laughs> spent a lot of money on it, though. Uh, they went through a period of, of, uh, of putting in uh, ERPs, Enterprise Resource yes. uh, pro uh, Programs. Is that what it's yeah. for? ERPs, in, uh, which were supposed to solve the problems, uh, but um, each had enough unique features that, that they and, and, and covered a small enough part of the pie that they didn't solve the problems. Is is it possible for the Department of Defense to get to an auditable financial statement uh, without solving its systems problems, its, its oh, systems it, architecture it, it, it systems needs, problems? It needs to solve its systems architecture issues, at least as it relates to financial management, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, Advana is the system that I was talking, referring to before, Advana, however you want to say it, where they're trying to uh, take information from a range of information systems uh, and use that for enterprise-wide decision-making, if you will. And they're making, they're making good progress on that. Uh, but ultimately, you have to have timely, accurate, and useful information, not just for financial reporting, but to make informed decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, if you have timely, accurate, and useful information, um, financial, operational, uh, whatever, then, you know, the audit's not that tough. Uh, they also need to work on their controls, okay, internal controls uh, as well, because they have a number of major control weaknesses. But systems are fundamental. You know, you've got to have systems that provide timely, accurate, and useful information. So without being an expert on Advana or Advana, um, I would have said that it is something that brings current information to, to decision makers, so it's very helpful for that point of view, bringing information into one place, into one system, so it can be looked at and it can be analyzed. But it's my impression that it doesn't solve the, sy the system problems because it doesn't, it, it, it's dependent on the information that comes to it. And so when you talk about controls, you need controls on all those other systems that's that are correct. feeding Advana in order to solve the problem. That, that's, that's correct. We've all heard the saying, garbage in, garbage out, right? And so, you know, that's where you have to have controls with regard to the data that's going into the systems that's being pulled uh, in order to be able to make that decision on an enterprise-wide basis. And, and the department is well aware of that. And uh, I don't want to ask you an unfair question, so if, if I'm taking uh, you too much... You won't be the first time. <laughs> One of the issues the department has faced with information systems is that um, as the department tries to modernize it, it, it wants to buy commercial systems. And it's much more effective by commercial systems to, 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 to take technology that already works rather than trying to design your own. Uh, but then the department has so many unique processes and so many unique needs that it ends up tailoring these systems um, and undermines the purpose of buying commercial technology in the first place. So without wanting to be unfair to you, is that a problem that's solvable? How do we, how do we go about getting past that problem? Because it's, it's something we've been fighting for a period of, of a couple decades now, and I, I'm not aware that we've really reached a, a happy solution to it. 
The first thing you have to do is rationalize the processes because information systems are based on gathering information from various processes. So you need to streamline, simplify, uh, and to the extent appropriate, um, normalize uh, those types of processes before you try to uh, put in any type of new information system, if you will, okay? Because if you're right, we ought to use commercial off the shelf to the maximum extent possible. But there's a tendency of any organization, in particular the DOD, to say, we're different, all right? I remember as an example, I didn't relate to an information system, but you'll get a kick out of this. When I testified before Congress one time about uh, procurement uh, in, in the Defense Department, uh, and there were some systemic problems, many of which have made progress, but there's a ways to go. That's a typical GAO report. Progress made, much remains to be done, right? Uh, we had something that I refer to as the war wagon. What the war wagon was, it was a trailer, and there was money left over near the end of the year, and of course, you know, you can't not spend the money, you know, get the money, spend the money. So the Army decided, well, we're going to buy a bunch of trailers, because we need trailers to hook onto the Humvees, right? So, but they couldn't buy commercial off the shelf. We're the Army. We're different. We need something special, right? So they customized this trailer. Well, there was only two problems with it after they bought hundreds of them. Okay, two problems. Number one, it either A, didn't stay hooked to the Humvee, uh, or B, it did significant damage to the Humvee if it did stay hooked to it. So you had hundreds of these things sitting in a warehouse not being used, all right? That's an example of... Uh, you're not as different as you think you are, okay? And and we really need to, to the maximum extent possible, use commercial off the shelf. And you have to rationalize your processes. Uh, that's really step one. I appreciate that point. I, I've had the concern that, that the department and perhaps the federal government in general tend to look to technology solutions when technology isn't the problem, the process is the problem. Um, yeah, and I, I would agree with that, okay? I also would come back to something I said earlier. Um, you know, the mission of the Department of Defense is to provide for our national security, uh, to be able to try to prevent war, uh, but if war comes, to win the war. Uh, and it is very, very mission focused. But in order to be successful there, you gotta have a good mission support operation too, right? The problem is, is that the mission side, which if you refer to the military capabilities, is shrinking, okay? And the mission support side, which some people refer to as the tail, has grown dramatically. Uh, another example of rationalizing the process, you gotta rationalize the bureaucracy. It is way, way, way too big. Uh, I remember when I had the good fortune to attend Capstone, which as you know is for new generals and admirals, you know, back in the early 2000s. I, I remember one four-star who will go unnamed because that's part of the agreement. Uh, you can talk about what was said, but you can't say who said what, right? Uh, said that uh, in order to activate and deploy uh, 15 members of the Guard or Reserve at that time, 25 different units within the Pentagon had to sign off. Now, there's a difference between FYI and sign off, right? Well, why do you even have 25 units looking at this thing, right? So, so one of the things that really has to happen is to kind of re-baseline, you know, uh, what you need versus what you have, come up with a delta and figure out how you're going to rationalize. That's what I did at GAO, all right? Because when we left, we were 13% smaller, but over twice as productive and over three times the performance-based results. You mentioned with your experience at, at GAO that you had to prioritize and decide what you're going to take on first. If you were looking at the Department of Defense, what would you take on first and on the management side? Well, you know, I think rationalizing the bureaucracy is absolutely critical. I think, and, and it really ties into some of the things that, you know, you and I are talking about. You know, you, you, know, you, gotta, you gotta focus on the processes, and then you gotta rationalize the systems. Uh, you know, uh, too many players, too many layers, uh, too many uh, customized approaches. What do you think the department can do to better position itself to address future management challenges, to put itself in the best position going forward? Is, is, is the organizational issue you talked about with, with uh, the chief know, officer that the most I, I feel very, very strongly, and I know GAO does too, uh, that 
We need to learn lessons from others. Uh, that includes other democracies, uh, for example, the United Kingdom, uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, as an example. You know, they have something like a chief performance officer uh, who, uh, who is a, uh, may or may not be a political appointee, okay, but is at a high level reporting directly to the secretary, in the case of DOD, could be the deputy secretary, all right, who's focused full time on, you know, transformational change, operational management issues, all right. Now, as you know, in parliamentary systems like UK and Australia and New Zealand, the, the the minister is also in parliament, so it's you know they're they're wearing a dual hat, right? So in their system, they really want somebody who's focused, you know, on as the chief operating officer with continuity, uh, and they have performance contracts, they have term performance. I, you know, I think we need something like that. I want to ask you about what advice you'd give people going into this situation in positions where they could make a difference. But I want to I want to do it in in, in uh, because of because of the unique perspective you have. I want to ask you in several several tiers. I want to ask sure. somebody who's going in as a member of Congress, who's perhaps going to sit on the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, or the House Armed Services Committee. Somebody who's going into a senior political position, um, and then somebody who's going in at, at an SES level at a, at a management level. So I'll ask you those one at a time. Of, of what what kind of advice would you give that person? In terms of the way they should approach this issue, the management issues, or think about management. Yeah, issues. let me different, different let me types talk, of uh, let me talk in general, like Congress. Um, Congress is part of the problem; it needs to be part of the solution. Uh, m my concern is 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 the debates that we have about Defense Department funding are very superficial. Now, if you're for defense, you want to plus up the budget. Uh, if you're if you're not for defense, you want to cut the budget. That's overly simplistic. Uh, the fact is, is that uh, you need to look underneath the hood. Uh, we have enough resources, but we're not de deploying those resources properly, all right? Uh, rationalizing the bureaucracy is absolutely critical. But in addition to that, Congress sometimes tries to micromanage, uh, in particular with regard to, you know, weapon systems and other types of procurement activities, that they want certain things done because they have a vested interest. You know, the company who's making it might be in their district or employment in their district or whatever else. I mean, I remember the F-22, there were 49 states that, uh, that were providing some type of product or service dealing with the F-22, and I'm going to myself, well, who's the 50th? I mean, somebody got left out, you know? <laughs> but, but in any event, uh, and, and so, you know, we need to look much more... Uh, thoroughly, you know, and under the hood. The other thing is we have to recognize who our real threats are. You know, who, who are the current and emerging threats? Uh, and are we well aligned to try to be able to deal with those current emerging threats? Uh, uh, so those would be some thoughts with, we, with regard to Congress. With regard to somebody coming in uh, at, at the executive level at the Defense Department, and so where, okay? I mean, you know, my, my view is, is the next Secretary of Defense, whoever that is, and the next Deputy Secretary of Defense need to recognize some of the things that you and I have been talking about. And it needs to come from the top. And they need to take steps to try to be able to address the issues that we're talking about in a way that is sustainable within and between administrations, okay? Because by definition, most secretaries don't last more than two or three years. Most Deputy Secretaries don't last more than two or three years. And I will say, uh, Deputy Secretary Hicks, in particular, has been much more engaged in these kinds of issues in general and with regard to the Defense Business Board than any other one that I've seen in, in, in recent years. So they're taking it seriously, but they're not going to be here forever, right? That's just the way it is. Uh, and, and depending upon where else you're coming in, recognize there's a difference between your unit, all right, or your service, and what's in the collective best interest of all of us. All right. So don't be too parochial. Don't just focus on, you know, your, your thing, but recognize your piece of a much bigger puzzle. And, and a lot of the challenges that we face cross these silos, cross, ge you know, geopolitical boundaries. And we need to be coming at it, you know, uh, on, on a cooperative and integrated uh, basis. Um, and what other level did you want me to hit? No, you, you, you've covered it. Let me ask you one other one other question. Um, I want to ask you about about the the budget rules, because that's something yeah. that you've seen over the years. Um, and 
there are reasons why we have them, and obviously, with your with your career interest in 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 reducing the the, the deficit and the debt and, and the burden yeah. on the taxpayers, you've got an interest in these. Um, but there there are concerns that the way we have the rules set up, uh, we discourage investment, we encourage short term types of yeah. decisions, um, and some of that is played into by the by the way the rules are set up um, as as to how we count. And, and we don't have separate investment accounts, for example. We don't, uh, if, 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 you, if you're going to pay money up front, you, you may have to, you know. Uh, the way we keep score matters. The right? way we keep so, score yeah, matters. Yeah, yeah. I guess my question right. is, yeah. how much of a problem do you think that is? Well, that's and, a problem. And, and, Let's and talk is, macro. It, is it something that's solvable, with, consistent with the overall objective of keeping an eye on the deficit and the debt? I mean, we, yeah, let, let's let's talk macro, government wide. Okay, obviously that also applies to the Defense Department, but let, let's talk government wide. All right, um, um, we should have we should have um, uh, an investment budget and an operating budget. All right, uh, we should be seeking to try to um, to make investments uh, that will generate a positive rate of return. We should try to achieve balance in the operating budget over a business cycle. We should change the metrics of how we're, me uh, we're measuring. Uh, the debt ceiling has been a dismal failure. It has not constrained deficit spending and escalating debt burdens, all right? Uh, you know, balanced budget will not work, especially if you end up talk having an investment. We need to be doing, in many cases, more investment and less consumption, all right? So what we need to go to is we need to go to a debt-to-GDP approach. And why do I say debt-to-GDP? It's pro-growth because if you grow the denominator faster than the numerator, even if the numerator is going up, you're making progress. That's what we did after World War II. And we went from over 100% of GDP down to about 30 by 1980. But now we're doing the exact opposite. If you count total debt which means debt uh, held to the, owed to the public as well as the trust funds. We've passed the World War II all-time record, and we're heading up rapidly, getting close to 200% of GDP by 2050. That will have serious adverse economic, diplomatic, military, and domestic tranquility consequences if we allow that to happen. We cannot allow that to happen. So, yes, we need to change how, how we keep score, all right? We need to treat investments different than operating. but. We also need to be careful about what we call investments. You know, they need to they need to be expected to generate a positive rate of return, not just spending that somebody wants to call. By the way, we also have to look at direct spending and indirect spending. Indirect spending, like $1.7 trillion a year in deductions, exemptions, credits, and exclusions through the tax code. Uh, you know, they need to be subject to the same type of review and analysis as direct spending, and they're not, okay? They also need a lot more visibility in the financial statements uh, than they get right now. So, uh, you know, uh, biennial budgeting uh, is something we ought, to, we ought to be taking a look at. I mean, Congress has gotten a, a timely budget appropriations bills done four times in my lifetime. That's an F minus. And they're not going to get it done this year either, right? Uh, so there, there's just lots of fundamental reforms that are needed to revitalize our democracy, and quite frankly, not only to improve economy efficient and effectiveness, but to restore a republic that's representative of and responsive to the public, because that's not what we have right now. Well, that's, that's, that's probably a good place to, a good place to end. I'd like to ask you if you have any, any final thoughts that you'd like to share before we, uh, before we wrap this up. Public service is a high calling. I've had the opportunity to run three federal agencies, two in the executive branch, one in the legislative, as well as serving in various other roles. Um, I recommend it highly. I think everybody ought to do public service, not necessarily in government, but at some point in time during their lifetime. Uh, it's one of the things that should bind us together. Uh, you know, it's important to make a decent amount of money to have a decent standard of living, but in the final analysis, it's not how much you're worth, it's the difference that you make. Um, uh, and uh, you can make a big difference you, at any level in government. You, ha you can have a lot of responsibility. You have a lot of authority. Uh, we need good people. And so I, I would encourage people to seriously consider it. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time with us today. And I want to thank you for living by what you just said and, 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 and making your own contribution because you've made a huge contribution to our federal government. And, and
I thank you for that. Thank you, Peter, very much. And thanks for your service.